We're rolling. This is our last recording from the Tox Cowboy Bull Ring, last recording from World Championships. And I told Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes to stop giving me heart attacks. I can't handle it. And then they give me a heart attack for the World Championship point. Anna Patricia, perfect swing. They challenged it. Couldn't tell if the gold medal was won or not. Had to take two more points to win. And then they became the first American World Champions since Jen Kesty and April Ross in 2009 in Stavanger, completing a remarkable day for the USA as a whole. Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth got it started off with a great note, winning a bronze medal over the Australians. Taliko Clancy and Maria Fay Artaccio, they became the first bronze medalists for the USA since Liz Mezekai and Elaine Youngs in 1999. How's that for your first world championships, ladies? Two medals for the USA. Trevor Crabbe and Theo Bruner couldn't get it done, ended up in fourth. Still a tremendous tournament for Trev and Theo. Couldn't get their medal. The long awaited medal for Trev and Theo. Three times they finished fourth. It's madness out here in Slash Collar. What a wonderful week. That's it from the bull ring. We will finish this recording back with my producers one and two, who I miss and love so very much. So I'll see y'all in the studio. Action says producer one, the OG Road to Paris producer. Meanwhile, producer two. I was gone for 12 days, and this dude looks like a totally different kid. He's sitting up on his own. I can't remember if he was doing that before I left for Mexico. It feels like I was gone for about two years. Well, in Mexico, it felt like I was gone for a blink, and then I come back and see producer two, who looks like he gained about eight pounds of pure fat <laughs> to be converted into muscle. It was a long time, world champs, but I'm back with my two producers. This video is being finished by producer three though so we are a big four person road to paris team now and you now i know i mentioned kelly chang and sarah hughes obviously in my wrap up in slax cala mexico but i do just want to give another humongous shout out to the world champions the 2023 world champions kelly chang and sarah hughes for the last two months they have been in by their terms a mid-season lull and by mid-season lull it is a couple fifths here and there one ninth and they've just been working on stuff. You know, Jordan Chang brought out a setting hoop that you would see indoors to dial in this new system that they have. Kelly's jump setting. She's bump shoot setting. Sarah's hand setting. She's shoot setting. They're running all kinds of fun stuff. You saw the very last play of the World Championships, actually. Sarah ran sort of a quick set into the middle, or she did at the end of that second set. And these are all new systems. And they finally perfected it. It came to fruition at the right time. And I was talking to them after. They said, you know, there were moments of frustration. There were moments that we didn't know if this was actually going to pan out when we wanted it to. And it just speaks, it's a testament to how hard they worked. They were doing double days and for them to peak at just the right time, it's such a difficult thing to do. And they nailed it. The first gold medal at a world champs since Jen Kesey and April Ross in 2009 in Stavanger, Norway. And now I did the math. So this will be less like a recap of world champs and more what it means for the overall Olympic picture. So I did the math and Kelly Chang, Sarah Hughes, Sharpie. Now, I, I do want to get ahead of this and answer a question that many of you guys asked on Instagram in that because Kelly and Sarah won the world championships, does that mean that the United States now gets three bids because we get a bid for the world champs? Do we get two more teams via the Olympic rankings, which would then give Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes that second spot? Uh, the answer is no. So you can only earn one bid for your federation. So Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, they could either earn the Olympic bid via points or they can earn it via world champs. They cannot earn it for both and therefore get three American teams into the Olympics. The only time a country has been allowed to have more than two teams in the Olympics was in the inaugural Olympic Games in 1996. And that was mostly to placate the AVP and the men who were sort of throwing a fit about the Olympic qualification process because the AVP was the best. But I digress. So Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes, even with that gold medal, they are still number three in the Olympic ranks. They are behind Duda and Anna Patricia, the silver medalist, the classiest silver medalist in the world. Have to, I just cannot speak highly enough of Anna Patricia and Duda. Before they even got their silver medals, they were called up to the podium. The first thing they did, shake Kristen Nuss and Taryn Close hands, give them hugs. Shake Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes hands, give them hugs. And silver medal is just so brutal because you lose that match and 15 minutes later, you have to put on your happy face. 
take your silver medal. They could have been the third team in history to win multiple world championships. The other two teams being Misty May trainer and Kerry Walsh Jennings and the other being Brazilians, Ishel Bead and Adriana Behar. So Anna Patricia and Duda with that silver medal, they are number one in the Olympic ranks. Kristen Nuss and Taryn Kloff, the first American bronze medalist we have had since 1999. Liz Mazakayan and Elaine Youngs. I believe that was in Marseille, France, but I could be wrong. I'll have to fact check that one. And then number three is Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes. And I'm calling it. I'm putting Sharpie treatment for Chang and Hughes, Sharpie treatment for Nuss and Cloth. And the reason that I'm giving the Sharpie for Chang and Hughes, they're not guaranteed to go to Paris just because they won world champs. We are one of the very few federations in the world, maybe the only one where if our winner of world champs is actually outside of our top two in points, they would not actually get the bid. However, the points boon that they had from this event, Kelly and Sarah now have 9,040 points. That is 904 per event. Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth have 9,360 points. That is 936 per event. They are 500 behind Anna Patricia and Duda. Down at number 10, tied for 10, is Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes are tied with China's Chen Shu and Xin Yi Sha. They are 2,620 points behind Kristen and Taryn and 2,300 behind Kelly and Sarah. They're averaging 612.7 per event. And so I'm not giving Kelly and Sarah and Kristen and Taryn the Sharpie treatment because the USA doesn't have a close third team. They have a great third team. Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes were marvelous. At World Championships, Betsy Flint, most aces per match. Julia Scholes was huge. Her optioning was fantastic. But it's just to qualify in the American system, you have to be a top three team in the world. And the the numbers just don't add up, especially with only one more Elite 16 in Brazil this year. And then I don't know what the schedule is going to look like next year, but they would virtually have to go on a gold medal spree and hope for a slump from Kristen and Taryn and Kelly and Sarah. So this is a very different race than it was in Tokyo, where Kelly and Sarah Sponsel won the Sochi four-star, their first gold medal of the team, and then they won the Ostrava four-star to complete the Olympic qualification period on back-to-back gold medals, and they jumped Brooke Sweat and Kerry Walsh Jennings in those last two events. So that was a thriller. This one, I'm all but calling eight months left in the Olympic qualification process. I think the American race is pretty much over, which doesn't mean that we're not going to see Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes. We're not going to see Therese Cannon and Megan Kraft. That we're not going to see Alex Klein and Haley Harwood. We're, we're still going to see those teams competing internationally for points, for prize money, for the USA stipend, for experience. But I think that uh, you can put a Sharpie on it. Our Olympic teams will be Kelly Chang and Sarah Hughes and Kristen Nuss and Taryn Cloth. Now, the number two storyline from the world champs, the Brazilian women's race, I think is pretty much over. Barbara and Carol, so I did give them the Sharpie treatment, and they had the opportunity to just kick the door shut. And then they lost to Tana Silva and Victoria Lopez, the only team who really has a realistic shot at catching them. Now, Tana and Victoria tried to give that opening match away. If you want to watch that replay on Volleyball TV, I highly recommend it. It's a thrilling match. Barbara and Carol didn't end up winning it, lost in three. Meanwhile, Tana and Victoria ended up beating Germans Cindy Tillman and Savannah Mueller, and then they lost in the quarterfinals to Chang and Hughes. But even with that fifth, Victoria and Tana are now number eight in the Olympic ranks. So, I mean, we think we're deep with Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes at number 10. Brazil has their third team at number eight. However, they're still 1,780 points behind Barbara and Carol. They're averaging 596.6 per event versus Barbara and Carol's 745. Meanwhile, Agatha and Rebecca, they're at number 22. They authored a number of upsets. They did beat Kelly and Sarah in pool play, and then they did beat Laura Ludwig and Louisa Littman, who I'm so impressed by in the first round of the elimination bracket. They're averaging 590 per event. They are number 22. So I don't think that any of the Brazilian women are in a position to catch Barbara and Carol, especially because Tana... And Victoria, they have their 12 finishes. So now they're not just adding finishes. They're actually replacing bottom ones. So their rate of growth is going to slow by quite a bit. Barbara and Carol also have 12 finishes. So their rate of growth is also going to slow. But they have already staked themselves to a very large lead. And so Barbara and Carol, they can pretty much just rest on their points if they wanted to. They're not going to, of course, because they're competitive and extremely talented. 
But I think that where they stand right now, they could not add one point and they could still be Brazil's number two team. So it's still, it's interesting because they didn't slam the door, but Tane and Victoria, they do still have an outside chance. And if Agatha and Rebecca go on some divine run, they can get there. So there's still some level of intrigue to the Brazilian women's race. Uh, the most interesting women's race to me is actually, on the women's side anyway, is the Swiss women. So Nina Brunner and Tanya Huberly, I'm giving them the Sharpie treatment. They got a fifth at the World Championships. Nina Brunner has been one of my favorite defenders to watch for a long, long time. Plays so well behind Tanya Huberly, a very talented blocker. They had a thrilling quarterfinal or a uh, ninth place round win over Betsy Flint and Julia Scholes. Brunner was number three in digs per match behind Molly McBain of Canada, who played an excellent world championships. Her rate of development is extraordinary. And then behind, of course, Kristen Nuss, who had nearly double the total volume of digs than anyone in the field. It, absolutely insane. So I'm giving Nina and Tanya the Sharpie that their fifth place finish at world champs put them at number 12 in the Olympic ranks, and they only have eight finishes. Right now, they're averaging 792.5 points per event. So they're on track. If we were to scale that to the full 12 finishes, they're going to hit 9,510. They will be well in the Olympic qualifying range. So the top women's spot for the Swiss, I think, is all but sealed up. Now, the number two is fascinating because Zoe Verge Dupre and Esme Bobner, who I consider to be the Kelly Chang and Sarah Sponsel, of this year's quad where Kelly and Sarah, they were just sort of this young team looking to break through. They're always super talented, couldn't quite get that big gold medal until the very last couple of events. Zoe and Esme have been primed for a very similar breakthrough. They just haven't quite had it yet. However, they are number two in the Swiss women's race. Number 13 in the world after a ninth place finish. They're averaging 553 points per event. Their job now, and it's a shame that the Olympic qualification system makes it mostly a battle against your own countrywomen, and in this case, your own sister, as Zoe has to fend off older sister Anouk, who is an Olympic bronze medalist with Joanna Mater. Now, Anouk and Joanna, they lost in the first round. No shame in their loss. They lost to a very talented Italian team in Valentina Guattari and Marta Menegatti. And that was after they took a fourth at the World Championships last year. Now, they haven't, they just haven't quite looked themselves since Joanna's injury at last year's World Championships, and that's completely understandable because it was a serious injury. And so they, they just haven't really had the time to peak yet. And I think that the COVID effect is carrying over into this quad because we missed out on that year of sort of preparation before you get into Olympic qualifying. Because Tokyo was in 2021, we pretty much hopped straight into Olympic qualifying. And so Anouk and Joanna, they just haven't really had the time to, it seems they haven't had time to really fine tune and perfect their game and get back to where they were. They are now number 19 in the Olympic ranks, 1,720 points behind Zoe and Esme. They're averaging 546 per event, which is just seven behind Zoe and Esme per event. So it's pretty much neck and neck for that second women's spot in Switzerland. That's the race right now that I'm most fascinated by on the women's side. Now, we are going to move on to the men, but finally, I can take a Waikia water break. Man, I tell you what, I missed Waikia down in Mexico. Miss, missed you guys a lot. Cheers. Almost as much as I miss producers one and two. Now, for the men, before I get to Trevor Crabb and Theo Bruner, I just have to make a note about the historical podium that happened in Tlaxcala. So in gold was Andre Perisic and David Schweiner. They won their third gold medal of the season. That is the first world championship medal for the Czech Republic in its history. In silver, the Swedes, David Amon and Jonathan Helbig, who I predicted in January to win the world champs, just missed. I did nail Kelly and Sarah, though. Appreciate y'all. Their silver medal, first world championship medal in Swedish history. In bronze, Bartosz Wojciak and Michael Brill. First world championship medal in Polish history. So for the first time ever, we had three federations winning their first world championship medal on the same world championships. It's been going on since 1997 in Los Angeles. That's the first recognized world championships. This is the 14th rendition of it. So it's just a testament to how far and wide 
and deep and talented the game is spreading that in 2023 we had three federations making their very first podium huge shout out to all them andre parasage david schweiner six events this season i called them the slow roasters of the year in my last road to paris they're now the sandbaggers of the year coming in as the 16 seed the 16 maybe that's why when i put up a instagram poll prior to world championships asking who people thought would go to win only three percent of you Pick the checks. Tyler Penberthy, shout out to you, buddy. You nailed it. Those guys are so good. They've won half the events they've played this year. Unreal. Even though they're just six events in, Sharpie hit them. Well, actually, literally Sharpie. They are literally Sharpied in. They just sealed their ticket to the Paris Olympic Games. So, Paris H. Schweiner, love you guys. Won't be talking about you a whole lot more on this show anyway because you're done. You made it. Congratulations. Now, on to... A very fascinating development, Theo Bruner and Trevor Crabb. So after <laughs> after they lost to Poland, I catch up with Theo, and he goes... Three-fourths. Has anyone done that? Has anyone ever done that before? I'll have to look that up. Because how hard is it to be good enough to make the semis and bad enough <laughs> to get fucking four or three times? <laughs> and so, of course, I go and do my homework, and the answer is no. No one has actually finished fourth more than once. So Theo and Trevor Crabb are now the only players in beach volleyball history to have multiple fourth place finishes at the World Champs, which speaks to how well they play at big events, making a semifinal at the World Championships, not once, not twice, but thrice for Bruner, is a remarkable testament to his ability in the big events, and then Trevor Crabb to do it twice. Trevor Crabb, by the way, led the tournament in digs, led the tournament in digs per match. Unbelievable. This is the guy's first year playing full-time defense, and he's leading the World Championships, the stiffest event of the year in digs. Excellent stuff from Trevor Crabb. Excellent stuff from Theo Bruner. And now their fourth gives them 1,120 points, more than 300 more than their biggest finish of the year. That puts them 740 points ahead of Triborn and Came Shock. This is the first time Theo and Trev have been at the number two spot in the Olympic ranks, so they jumped Try and and came more on them in a bit they're now averaging 570 points for per event versus a pretty rough 450.9 for try and came who are i mean they are driving the struggle bus big time now they're trending up as well so not only is this a huge points finish for them not only was it the best that they have played i think anyway though it's kind of a toss-up between when they won gold medal in espino versus fourth here but now their points should get them straight into the final Elite 16 of the year in Brazil. They'll be way into the last challenge event that they'll play this year in Haiku, China, which I'll be commentating. So if they make the finals anyway, I'll be commentating Saturday and Sunday. Um, and now with the way that Try and Came are playing and the way that their entry points have just plummeted, depending on how they do in India, which will be, in, be this weekend, they could very well be back into challenge qualifiers. They were once mid elite 16 qualifiers and now they're back into challenge qualifiers so they're gonna have to figure something out and in a hurry because time is running out this year there should be a number of events next year however for them to start making up some ground and before people start totally counting this men's races over which a number of you are just remember triborn and trevor crab finished fourth in the 2019 world championships in hamburg and still didn't make the Olympic Games. That went to Jake Gibb and Taylor Crabb, who did not have that great of a finish at World Champs. So this race is not over. Theo and Trev still have a lot of work to do. All the American men's teams, with the exception of Miles Partain and Andy Benish, have been very up and down. And so it's still going to be a super interesting race to follow, especially with the development of Chase Budinger and Miles Evans. So these dudes just went down, took a flyer, really, to Mexico thinking that someone might drop out. Well, Gambia had visa troubles. They couldn't get into the tournament. So in chase and miles went, made Trevor and Theo's pull the pool of death against George and Andre and Ukraine's Sergey Popov, most underrated player in the world, since the secret's out about David Schweiner now and Edward Resnick. And then their blowout over Ukraine made Trevor and Theo's match against George and Andre a win and you win pool and a lose and you're out. So Trevor and Theo were three points away from taking a 37th. Instead, they took a fourth. These are the razor-thin margins that this Olympic race is won by. So Miles and Chase, they are now number 27 in the Olympic ranks, and they're averaging 457.8 
points per event, which is 7.8 points higher than try and came. So in a point per event average, Chase and Miles are actually in a better situation than try and came. So this race is pretty bonkers for the U.S., and it's going to be fascinating. The, the last couple races have come down to the very last event for the U.S. men. I would not expect any less for the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. And that is a reminder, the deadline is June 9th, 2024. The schedule's not out yet, but I would anticipate Ostrava to be the last event as it has been for the last two years. Uh, the number two storyline for the men, the Brazil race is super interesting. So George and Andre, like Barbara and Carol, had the chance to slam the door shut. And then they didn't break pole. Meanwhile, Pedro and Guto, who were way down in the race, mostly because they had a late start, they took a fifth. Because Evandro and Arthur, they had a chance to slam the door shut. They did on Vitor Philippe and Hanato Lima, knocked them out in the first round of elimination. But then they had the chance to knock out Pedro and Guto, and they didn't take it. Ended up losing. So Pedro and Guto took a fifth after getting knocked out by Trev and Theo. Now, Pedro and Guto are number 21 in the Olympic ranks. They're averaging 660 points per event, which is the highest in the Brazilian Federation. So George and Andre are the number one ranked team in the Brazilian Federation. They're number five in the world. They're averaging 636.6 per event. So they're actually, while they're number one in gross, they are number two in points per event. Evandro and Arthur, meanwhile, are number six in the world, but they're averaging 615 points per event. So they are number three in the point per event average. And then at the bottom is Hanato and Vitor. They could have made a huge move, but they lost first round to Evandro. They're averaging 523 points per event. So despite being number 11 in the world, they are actually way down in the Brazilian Olympic race. That is by far, to me, the most compelling men's race because their lowest ranked team at number four is the 21st ranked team in the world. And Pedro and Guto, they have so many finishes to add. They just have eight events so far. Meanwhile, George and Andre have hit their 12. Hanato and Vitor have hit their 12. And Evandro and Arthur have hit their 12. So the rate of growth for Pedro and Guto is going to be super high as they're just adding finishes instead of replacing them. So the Brazilian men's race, whew, it's a wild ride. And the last big storyline from Tlaxcala, among many. I mean, I could have a four-hour road to Paris after World Champs, um, but we've already produced a couple videos, and I, I think there's probably some World Champs exhaustion for most of you guys. For the diehards, for the diehards, by the way, I loved meeting all of y'all who came down to Tlaxcala. Thank you so much for saying hi. Uh, loved getting to meet you guys and hang out and chat a little bit. Uh, you guys are always the one that I have dialogues with on Instagram and the YouTube comments. Good to put a face to the screen name. But Stefan Bormans and York de Groot, they are back. So one, I love Stefan Bormans. Uh, we spent a, a fair amount of time just chatting. We stayed at the same hotel, and we just kept running into each other. And we actually sort of watched Miles and Chase's match against Ukraine. And then we did the math and figured out that Trev and Theo's match against George and Andre was actually a win and in and a losing you're out. And so it was just like a thriller that we watched at like 1130 at night together. It was awesome. Um, but they took a fifth, lost what I think is the match of the tournament to Sweden's David Amon and Jonathan Helvig. Something like 32-30, deep in the second set, and then deep in the third as well. And Bormans was hilarious. I mean, he was just like, you know, I just got served 55 serves. York got six, and I had to chase around these jumping Swedes. And so I'm exhausted. I need a nap. And he deserves one. Fifth place at the World Championships. They're now number 24 in the Olympic ranks, and number three in the Netherlands. However, they've only played six events, so they have six more to just add on, free and clear, total gross points adding to their total. They're, they're averaging 740 points per event, which is the highest in the Dutch Federation. So that is higher than Alex Brouwer and Robbie Musen, who took a ninth at World Champs. They are number seven in the world. They're averaging 696 per event, and then... Matthew Immers and Steven Vandeveld also took a ninth. They are number 17 in the world and averaging 516 points per event. So Stefan Bormans and New York de Groot are trending to be the number one team in the Dutch Federation. So we have a very interesting race on the men's side with the American men. We have a very interesting race with the Brazilian men. We have a very interesting race with the Dutchies. Now, fun development as well. So I chatted with uh, Volleyball World CEO Finn Taylor and we're going to start working together, Volleyball TV and this Road to Paris series, where I should start to have access to the Volleyball World, uh, Volleyball TV, rather, archives. So instead of just the still pictures, 
it's going to be a lot of the highlights from volleyball TV. So that's going to be super fun. The production value of these Road to Parises should go up. Uh, hopefully we can even get the Road to Parises on volleyball TV. We'll see. Who knows? Uh, but it was really good to see Finn, really good to see the staff, Volleyball World, really good to see all the international buds down in Mexico. I hadn't seen them since I played in the Cape Town Elite 16 and got to hang out there. It was awesome. Taren Close dad, legend. Nice got job! Do you hear that? Well, let's ask him. Hey, what just happened? I don't know. What? <laughs> we won. You won. You have to stop. You have to tell the camera what just happened. Speak into my microphone. Uh, they just won. <laughs> Big time won. He talks all the time. Tomorrow, tomorrow semifinals. <laughs> Seriously? This, or are you scared? Talk. I'm, scared. I, I'm stage fright. Back. <laughs> That's why you guys are on the stage. I'm not really being good at it. See, why does he even wear one of those good things? <laughs> Don't scream in my ear. I won't. <laughs> and got to meet Valentina Guitar. He's met dad, absolute sweetheart. So it was, it was cool to meet the players, to see them again. Cool to meet their families. Um, just have so much respect for all the players on the Olympic grind. Now, it's time for our... Sign off, Mr. Producer 2. I'm skipping the struggle bus today. You guys know who's on it. Triborn and Came Shock. They're on the struggle bus, buddy. I know. We don't like it when Uncle Tri is on the struggle bus. Uh, next up is the India Challenge. They are in Goa. You can find all of that on Volleyball TV. Sorry. Hey, get the shot. Uh, you can find all that on Volleyball TV. I will not be commentating. I will be at a bachelor party in Tennessee. Shout out my boy, Alex Cook. Uh, so I don't know if I'll do a road to Paris after that challenge. Might wait till after the China challenge in Haiku. That'll be the first week in November. So it might take just a little bit of a break. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed producer three though, adding a lot of cinematic value to the road to Paris recently. And he's the one behind this production as well as his producer one and two. So that'll do it for the final world champs road to Paris. And what do we say producer two shoots.